through the scriptures that we come to understand how we as individuals might have everlasting life. And this morning I'd like us to look at a summary verse. And what I mean by a summary verse is that this verse sort of sums it all up. And there are plenty of them in the Bible. We're only going to look at one this morning. A summary verse that teaches the way of salvation. And in this particular verse, it teaches what we call an uttermost salvation. And that's the title of my message this morning, an uttermost salvation found here in Hebrews 7 and verse 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, and that him is referring to Jesus Christ. And he tells us why, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now to have a greater grasp on what this verse means, I'm going to try to ask and answer three questions as the Bible unveils to us what is called an uttermost salvation. And the first question is this, who is it that can be saved to the uttermost? And he tells us here in verse 25 where it says, He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, or if we could say it this way, by or through Jesus Christ. Here's what the Bible is saying. Every person who seeks to come to God through Jesus Christ are those that can be saved. He that cometh unto me, Jesus says, I will in no wise cast out. If you want to know God, if you want to get to God, there is only one way to get to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. And all those that come to God by Jesus Christ can be saved. Amen. Now I want you to notice some things about that statement. First of all, where these people are coming to. Where are they coming to? It says here, they are coming unto God. God. Now what does that mean? It means by coming to God, we're speaking of your whole self coming to God. When you came to church this morning, you didn't have a part of you come. You didn't come in here with your, with your one leg and leave another leg at home. You didn't come in here with one arm and leave another arm at home. You came in here from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Your whole person came into this building. When it says they that come to God, he's talking about not just a part of yourself, he's talking about the whole of yourself. If you want salvation, you don't say, well, God, I'll give you this part, but I'm not going to give you this part. No, God wants the whole thing. When Constantine made Christianity a state religion in 300 A.D., he required all of his soldiers to be baptized. And they were. However, many of the soldiers in their baptism left one part out of the water, and that was their sword. And as they went down underneath the water, they held up their hand holding their sword, keeping the sword out of the water and from being baptized. They gave God perhaps a part of them, but they didn't give God all of themselves. Your whole life is to be brought to God just like the Old Testament sacrifices were completely and wholly devoted to God. Paul said it this way, I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. What is that which you've committed? It's the whole of yourself. Who is it that God saves? All that come to God by him through Jesus Christ. And obviously coming to God implies leaving something else. When you come to God to be saved, what do you leave? And could I say it this way? You leave everything you think is good and you leave everything that you know is bad. You see, when you come to God, there are people who come to God and say, well, God, I'll do my best and I'll let you do the rest. That means you're coming to God thinking that somehow you're coming to God is good enough. 
And yet the Bible says that we are not saved by our goodness or our own righteousness or our own good works. You can join every church in town, but that's not going to get you to heaven. You can get baptized in the river 30 or 40 times. That's not going to get you into heaven. You can be the most upstanding person in the community, but that's not going to get you into heaven. Why? Because if you think you're good enough, you're not good enough. And so when you come to God, it implies that you are leaving everything you think is good, and it also implies that you're leaving what you know is bad. And when we use the term in the Bible, repentance, it doesn't mean giving up one sin in order to get to heaven. It means a recognition that I'm a sinner. When you go to the doctor, what are you saying to the doctor? I'm sick. I need your help. When you come to the Lord, what you're saying is, I've got a problem and only you can solve that. And so we come to God acknowledging to God our own sinfulness. So when we come unto God, this is how we come to Him. And how is it that we come? We come unto God by Jesus Christ. What is He saying here? It says that the only way that you and I can get into heaven is by faith in Jesus Christ. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus is an all-inclusive Savior. He includes all who come to God through Him. But it also means He's an exclusive Savior because there is no other way to come to God but by Jesus Christ. There is salvation in no one else, Acts 4.12, for there's no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved but by the name of Jesus Christ. So how is it that we're saved? We come unto God by Him, that is through Jesus Christ, and what do we come for? When you come to God, what do you come for? There are a lot of people who come to God for lots of things. They come to God for help in life's troubles. They come to God for deliverance from life's fears and anxieties. They come to God for protection from life's threats. I mean, how many people have prayed for God to protect them, God to deliver them, and God to help them? And by the way, none of those prayers are wrong. However, for salvation, there is a reason why you come to God through Jesus Christ. And what is that reason? It's a singular reason, and that is you're coming to God because you want mercy. It means that you want God to save you from your sins. There is only one group of people that come to Jesus, and that's sinners. And every sinner that comes to God through Jesus Christ, those are the ones who experience an uttermost salvation. I was preaching a number of years ago in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, to, to be actually, and uh, it was a, a, a two-week revival meeting. Now, I'm not that old, but when was the last time you went to a revival meeting that lasted two weeks, half a month? And on the second Monday of the second week, my wife was standing in the auditorium during the song service with a young lady that traveled with us and was working with us. And the lady turned to my wife and said, I need to talk to you right now. And they walked out in the lobby of the church. And this young lady, her name was Gretchen. And Gretchen said to my wife, Terry, she said, Terry, I need to be saved. Well, immediately my wife thought, well, she must be a Christian. She grew up in a Christian home. She went to a Christian high school. She went to a Christian Bible college. She got a degree in Christian education. She had taught in a Christian school, and now she was traveling with a Christian evangelist teaching children. Surely she must be a Christian. And my wife said, well, why don't you talk to my husband after the service? So after the service, we met together, and I sat down with Gretchen, took my Bible, with a sincere desire to help her understand the assurance of her salvation. Obviously, she was saved. She was just doubting her salvation. So I asked her some very, what I call, generic questions. Number one, when do you believe you got saved? And here's what she said to me. She said, Steve, I've always believed that Jesus is the Savior. I just never understood why I needed Him. 
That's called a red flag. And she told me how she had grown up believing in Jesus all of her life, but she believed in who he was, what he came to do, but she never experienced what it meant to trust Jesus to deliver her from her own sins. And so the rest of the time, all I talked about was her sins. You would have thought she would have gotten saved. She didn't get saved. You would have thought she would have got better. She didn't get better. She got worse. And for the next week, I've never seen anybody so absolutely miserable over their own sinfulness, over the way that they lived, the kind of person that they were. And one week later, she came back to our trailer that we were living in, walked in, literally got on her knees, and she said, I'm ready to get saved. You know what her problem was? It what, wasn't that she didn't know that she needed God. She didn't want to admit she needed mercy. And who is it that comes to God by Jesus Christ? Only those who recognize they need God's mercy. Do you recognize you need God's mercy? Yes. Have you ever cried out to God, be merciful to me, O Lord, a sinner? The whole idea of coming to God is the implication that I am seeking the mercy of God. This is the one that the Lord saves to the uttermost. And that leads me to the second question, and that is, how far does this salvation extend? What are the boundaries of this salvation? And notice what our text says. It says, he is able to save them to the uttermost. What does uttermost actually mean? It's an adjective describing our salvation. It comes from two words in the Greek language which really describes the fullness of uttermost. Number one, it means he's able to save all who come to him. That is, it extends to the uttermost guilt. That is this, that no one is beyond the power of the, of the Savior to save. He is able to save the absolute worst of sinners. To the uttermost guilt. Back in the early 1990s, I traveled overseas on a missions trip to Siberia, East Russia. It was right after the Berlin Wall had fallen and communism had fallen in Russia and the, the doors were open for Westerners to come and for people to come and preach the gospel. We flew from the United States up to, well, we flew up to Anchorage, Alaska, and from there we flew into the Far East of Russia into a city called Habarovsk, which is located just above the North Korea border. From there we got on a train and we went inland 15 hours to a city called Blagovishchinks that was sitting on the Amur River and across the river was northern China. And on that trip, 15 hours is a long time to be on a train. We did a lot of walking around, a lot of talking. And if we could meet a Russian that could be, speak some kind of English, we struck up a conversation with them. And I struck up a conversation with a couple of Russian soldiers who had just finished fighting in Afghanistan. You ever heard of Afghanistan? And I began to share the gospel with them. I began to explain to them how Jesus Christ died for them and how they could be saved and forgiven of their sins. Now here we are on the other side of the world. And you know what their response was? The same response you would hear from people all over the world. They said to me, God cannot forgive me because we have committed too many sins. And they did not go into any details of the things that they have done, but you can only imagine what it could have been like as they were soldiers in Russia fighting in Afghanistan and the violations of the laws of God and the laws of conscience that they felt in their soul because we are all made in the image of God and the law of God is written on our heart even if we don't know the laws as they're written in the Ten Commandments so that when we do wrong, our own conscience condemns us. And here they were only this train with a condemned conscience not thinking that God could save them and God allowed us to tell them that God's mercy extends to the uttermost guilt. Amen. It does not matter how far you've gone or how bad you are. His grace extends to you to the uttermost. 
And this extension is not only to the uttermost guilt, but it's also to the uttermost rejection. You see, there are lots of people who've grown up in a Christian home. They've heard the gospel. They have a knowledge of God. Perhaps you have grandparents that are Christians and you have a mother and father or a mother or father that are Christians. Perhaps you have a Christian sibling. Many of you are in this room today are believers and you have family members that are not believers. Perhaps you are educated in some form of a Christian school or you are homeschooled. But at some point you have decidedly decided not to believe. You have resisted a thousand prayers. You have wasted hundreds of of sermons, and you have run from countless appeals. And perhaps you're here this morning and you wonder, can God really accept me who has rejected him so persistently? And I say to you this morning, as the Lord says in his word, return unto me and I will return unto you. God's extension is to the uttermost rejection. If there is even a sense in your heart that you want his mercy and you want to be forgiven, though your rejection of him may extend for years over time, that rejection does not have to continue because he will not reject you if you come and receive him. So God is able to save to the uttermost. And let me also say that this extends to the uttermost despair. You know, there are many people <coughs> who despair of life. They live in a persistent depression, anxiety, bondage, and slavery. Their life extends from one pill to the next pill, somehow helping them to overcome the depression of their heart and their soul. And perhaps you are like that this morning. Does God's mercy extend to the uttermost despair? Well, there's one in the Bible who is a classic example of this. He was a man who lived by himself in a graveyard. He was a man that was filled with demonic spirits living inside of him. He ran around naked. He could not be held in chains. He would snap chains and no one would be, want to be around him. He was everything a person could be on an extreme manic state. He was a maniac until Jesus came walking towards him. And when he saw Jesus, he ran to Jesus and fell at his feet. And what did Jesus do? He delivered him from the demons that were in them and he, and he cast the demons out into a herd of swine that ran into the Sea of Galilee and drowned. And when we read the Bible, what do we discover about this man who was, who was naked, who was in bondage, who, who was running around, who was living a life out of control? We find him sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And the Lord is able to extend his salvation to the uttermost despair. That's what he means, uttermost. That is, he's able to save all who come to him. There is no exception, whoever you may be. But let me also say that the word uttermost means not only is he able to save all, but he is able to save completely. For the word uttermost has the idea of all to the end or all to the destination. You understand this. <clears throat> when you travel, you have a destination. You put it in your GPS where you're going to go and it gives you a route to get there and it gives you a destination when you arrive. The word for uttermost has the idea of a destination a place where you're going. And what he is saying is God's ultimate end is your final salvation. He will bring you to his intended end despite yourself. You see, for most of us, we experience salvation at an early point in our life. God saved us when we were a child. God saved us when we were a teenager. God saved us when we are a young adult. But folks, the rest of our life is a long road. It's a difficult journey. 
and we take in our life detours and sometimes we go down dead end streets and sometimes we go in directions we should not go and sometimes we wonder, has the Lord forsaken me? And the idea of an uttermost salvation is this. He that began a good work in you will bring it to completion to the day of Jesus Christ. He is not going to forsake his own. Your salvation was not based on you working towards salvation. It is not kept by your works. It is kept by his grace. And therefore God is able to save you from your temptations. You know, we all live in the moment, do we not? We live in the moment of the struggle. We live in the moment or the hardship. And it's hard for us to look down the road of life and to realize God is going to help me overcome this. I stumble, I fall, I feel like I'm in a hole. I'm in a dark point in my life, a dark spot. And we wonder if we're ever going to get out. And I want to tell you folks, it doesn't mean that you do nothing, okay? But actually you're doing something doesn't always resolve it. It is your coming to the Lord and just like the Lord saved you at a point in time, God saves you at this point in time the same way. You come to Him, you repent of your sin, you put your faith in Jesus Christ and He brings you out of that dark spot and He brings you out of that hole. He saves you. This uttermost salvation is God's ability to deliver you, to deliver you from temptations, to deliver you from your infirmities. I'm looking at in a room this morning with folks that a couple of you are over 50. (laughs) And it's really hard for these young people sitting here to understand this, but there will come a day when they start to get out of bed every morning and they're wondering, what new pain am I going to feel today? And I'm convinced of this because I'm learning this that one of the greatest struggles of our life spiritually are actually our infirmities. Our sicknesses. Our cancer. Problems that we have with our liver or our lungs. I've been visiting folks recently, pastor in the hospital that are wonderful godly Christian people. Had a pacemaker put in, have to go on kidney dialysis, living right now with great, great... These are good people. These are godly people. But you know what? Even at that point, they know the Lord's on their side, but sometimes days are dark and hours are long and it's hard. And even in those darkest hours of struggle and those times that you go through, the Lord has made a promise. His salvation is to the uttermost. I had a pastor friend of mine who died the very year that I went to Bob Jones University, 2014. He was 50 years old. We were personally very good friends. I preached in his church many times. He was one of the nicest people on the planet. And he called me up one day. This was like in May of 2014. First words out of his mouth. He said, Steve, I'm dying. I went, what in the, his name was Tom. I said, Tom, what in the world are you talking about? He says, I was just diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, 50 years old. I said, I'll be at your church on Sunday. He said, would you preach? I said, I'd love to. And so I drove up to Knoxville, Tennessee, Oak Ridge, Tennessee to be exact, and went to his church and preached there. And I've known Tom a long time, but he had lost a considerable amount of weight. It was very obvious he had a problem. I asked him, I said, have you ever preached at Bob Jones University? He said, I've never preached there. I said, I got a date for you in September this fall. He never made it. He passed away in August. And I was thinking about him as I was walking around in the grocery store with my wife one day, and I texted him. And there's an old song that I remembered, and the words go like this, I'm not holding on to Jesus, but Jesus is holding on to me. And I wrote him that. I said, because at this point, it's not about how faithful you are to the end, it's about how faithful he is to the end. Because at this point, there's nothing you can do but trust him him. Tom went to be with the Lord and he actually went to be with the Lord with some unusual experiences in his life. 
And yet he is a proof that when God saves you, my friend, he saves you to the uttermost, to the end. It is a complete and total salvation. That's what he does for you. And that leads me to the third and final thing. And that is, why is it that Jesus is able to save to the uttermost? Why is it that we have this confidence? Okay, it may, all right, let's be honest. It comforts me to know that God's going to be faithful. But why? What is it that's happening that I can know that this is actually true? And notice what he says in verse 25. He says, he's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Why? Seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. Why is it that Jesus is able to save to the uttermost? Because he ever lives to make intercession for them. So what does that mean? Well, the word here for an intercessor is a third party who, who comes between two people and makes a case on the behalf of one of them. All right? Let me give you a, a simple illustration. In the world of professional athletes, I'm talking about the ones that make a lot of money, all of them have an agent. And what does that agent do? The agent is the one that works with the team to get the player the contract he wants, the amount of money he's going to get paid, you know, all those kind of things. But it is that agent who stands between the team and the player that gets the contract set up. The word intercessor is the idea of the agent. And in this case, it is saying that Jesus Christ is our agent. He is our intercessor. And here, the writer of Hebrews is speaking about what Jesus is doing right now. I want you to think with me. When we think about the life of Jesus, do we normally think about what he was or did in the past? Or do we think about what he's doing right now? Typically, we think about the past. So when we think about the life of Jesus, we think about his incarnation. God became man in human flesh, the baby born in Bethlehem. Or we think about Jesus on a cross being crucified outside the city walls of Jerusalem, dying on the cross for our sins. Or we think of Jesus coming out of the tomb, resurrecting from the dead, and leaving that tomb empty. Or we think of Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives with his disciples and he ascends into heaven to go up to be with the Heavenly Father. In other words, we think about what Jesus did. But the question is, what is Jesus doing? It is now, today is the, what is it today, 13th of February? That's right, because of Mars Valentine days. I haven't gotten flowers yet. So to, this is the 13th of February it's 11.59. What is Jesus doing right now? Well, the writer of Hebrews tells us he is ever living to make intercession for us right now. Now, what does that mean for me? What is it that's happening right now that is so important to help me to understand I'm saved to the uttermost? Well, you have to go back in the Old Testament. And back in the Old Testament... <clears throat> God had established a way in which the Jewish people can have a relationship with him, and that is through a construction called the tabernacle and later changed to the temple, essentially the same basic thing. And essentially God established a way that man can have a relationship with God through what we call a priesthood. And there were designated priests, came from a tribe called the Levites, the Levitical priests, and they offered animal sacrifices of a particular type. And those sacrifices were, were offered for the people's sins. And once a year, the high priest of Israel would go into what was known the Holy of Holies, a room in the temple. And there offered this sac a sacrifice to God for the sins of the people, and then he would leave. And there were three basic problems with that Old Testament methodology. Number one... Those sacrifices were animal sacrifices and they could never take away sin. But therefore, they had to perpetually offer them. Number two, the priest could never stay in the presence of God permanently because if he did, he would die. And number three, the priest had to be constantly replaced with other priests because the priesthood was not permanent because the priest did die. 
So essentially, you have a problem with permanence. No permanent sacrifice, no permanent offering, no permanent priest. Therefore, the people lived in an in insecurity. And when the Bible says Jesus ever lives to make intercession, what is he talking about? Would you go back and look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22? Let me read 22, 23, and 24. It says, but so much was Jesus made a surety, that's a security, of a better testament. And they truly were many priests, that's the Old Testament, because they were not suffered or they were not permitted to continue by reason of death. In other words, those priests died. But this man, Jesus, because he continues ever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Now what does the Bible teach us? The Bible teaches that Jesus was a priest, but he didn't come through the Levites. He was a priest after a different order called the Melchizedek priesthood. And what is so important about the Melchizedek priesthood is a priesthood for which there is no end. There is no death. Jesus was a high priest and he offered a sacrifice. What is that sacrifice? His own life. He shed his own blood. He was the high priest of his own sacrifice. And what did he do? He entered into the very presence of God, just like the Old Testament high priest would enter into God's presence in the Holy of Holies. Jesus entered into the ultimate Holy of Holies because everything that happened down on this earth was simply a pattern of what's going on in heaven. And that's how we understand what happened. And what do we know? Jesus entered in to that holy of holies, the very presence of God. He offered his own blood as the sacrifice for our sins. And he didn't leave the Father's presence. He is in the Father's presence right now. And when it says he ever lives to make intercession for us, it means that we have permanence, we have security, we have a sacrifice, a priest, and we have an offering that has been given for us. And folks, we can't not be saved because Jesus is ever living for us. In other words, it's not about if you mess up, it's about if he messes up. And he's not going to mess up. And so for all of us, we mess up, we fall, we sin. We have an advocate. If we sin, Jesus will forgive us on this earth. But ultimately, we have one who ever lives to intercede for us. And because we have him in the presence of God for us, that means that we will be saved to the uttermost. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his heart. My name is written on his hands. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can thence make me depart, essentially is what he's saying. You and I can be saved to the uttermost. Because Jesus is in the presence of the Father for you and I right now. Amen. And that's why Paul could say, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friend, if you've never called on the Lord today, you need to be saved. And you have a Savior who will save you to the uttermost. Would you bow your head with me please as we pray? While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, may I ask this question this morning? How many of you would say, Preacher, I'm not all that I ought to be. I'm not all that I want to be. But I know this. I've been saved. And if I died today by the grace of God, I know that I would go to heaven. Because I have come unto God by Jesus Christ and the Lord has saved me to the uttermost. How many of you know if you're saved? If you are, would you raise your hand and hold it up? God bless you. you may put your hands down. Now, let me ask this question. Is there one who would say today, Preacher, if I died, I don't know I'd go to heaven. I've wondered if God could forgive me. I've done so many things for which I'm ashamed. Or perhaps you're here today and you've been doubting your salvation for a long time, wondering, God, can you really save me? 
And I, we'd like to pray for you this morning. No doubt God's brought you here today. You're here on purpose. It's his plan, even if it wasn't your plan. And you'd say, preacher, would you pray for me? For if I died today, I am not sure that I would go to heaven. But I want that security. Please pray for me. Would you lift your hand right where you're seated? Pray for me today, preacher. If I died, I don't know that I would go to heaven. Pray for me. I'd like to pray for you. Just lift your hand right where you're seated. Pray for me. All right, let me ask this final question. Is there one today who would say, Preacher, I do know I'm saved. <clears throat> but both in Sunday school and in this morning service, the Lord spoke to my heart about my sins. Things in my life for which I felt guilty over. And I know I'm saved. But I also know I need to come to my friend, Jesus, who advocates for me by cleansing me from my sins. I need to come to him today for personal cleansing and spiritual renewal in my heart, just like Peter denied the Lord. So I've denied the Lord in areas of my life. And you'd say, pray for me, preacher. God spoke into my heart as a Christian. And I know that there are things in my life I need to confess to him today. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand right where you're seated all over the building today? Pray for me. Pray for me. God bless you. You may put your hands down. Now, Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for your unchanging truth. And I pray that you'll bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen.